medulla is something which is more than 0.5 centimeter in size. Okay. So as I told you, what is a vesicle and what is a bulla? So vesicle is something which is 0.5 centimeter in size and bulla is something which is more than 0.5 centimeter in size. So the vesicobullous disorders, the primary event is the formation of a blister, blistering in the form of vesicle or a bulla. If they are small in size, these are vesicles, large in size is a bulla. And vesicles and bulla are basically accumulation or fluid within the within or beneath the epidermis. So as I told you, vesicles are small, less than 0.5 centimeter in size, and bulla uh, are more than 0.5 centimeter in size. So due to genetic mutations, what is the cause of these vesicobullous disorders? Either these are genetically acquired or are autoimmune response. And they can involve the epidermis, they can involve the epidermal dermal junction, epidermis, dermal junction, or the dermis. Some problem with the screen. Okay, when we classify the vesicobullous disorders as these are inherited or genetic blistering disorders or acquired or autoimmune blistering disorders. Now, these acquired or autoimmune blistering disorders are more common than the inherited ones. Some, uh, please pardon me, there's some problem going on. I, I don't know what is the problem going on. So, inherited genetic blistering disorder, we start with the first. These are a group called known as epidermolysis bullosa. And the important point is are these vesicula are formed in a child due to mild mechanical trauma. And there are three types depending on the level of the bulla in the skin. There could be epidermolysis bullosa simplex when it is in the epidermis. Epidermolysis bullosa junctionalis when it is a dermal junction, then a dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa when they split the bulla level of bulla is in the subepidermal area. Now, this is a representative photograph of the dermo epidermal basement membrane junction. So, this has basically three areas this is the epidermal area, this red one. This is the cytoskeleton or the basal keratinocyte. As you all know, the epidermis is made up of keratinocytes. These are the cells which are held together by desmosomes, the junctions. So this is the basically the keratinocyte. This is the dermoepidermal junction called lamina lucida and lamina densa. And this is the sublamina densa area or the dermal areas. Now, another diagram, this is something which is complicated, but you need to understand this. Again, this is a basal keratinocyte, as you can see. 
This is the basal keratinocyte has the hemidesmosome. This is a hemidesmosome. There are keratin intermediate filaments. And we have on the hemidesmosome uh, antigen called bolus pamphlet antigen 1 and leptin. And this is in contact with the lamina lucida and lamina densa. This is the base, this is the dermoepidermal junction. Now, this is the dermal part which is called sub lamina densa region and it has type 7 collagens. I4 collagens and all. Okay, and at the level of the dermo epidermal junction, there is bolus pamphlets and antigen 2. So, all this acquired ones will be discussed from this area. Now, starting with the first one, which is known as the epidermolysis bolosa simplex, it is an autosomal inherited as autosomal dominant inheritance, and important genes which are there are uh, keratin 5 and 4, 14 mutations are. Uh, they are resulting in bulla and within the basal keratinocytes. Now, as I told you, epidermolysis bullosa is totally a disease of, uh, it is due to trauma prone site. It occurs on the trauma prone sites only, okay? And what, what is special about this? It heals without scarring and there is no involvement of the mucosa. Mucosa means the oral cavity, eye, or genital mucosa and hair and nails. These are spared. So this is a very milder one. And important are these are there are keratin 4 and 5 and 14 mutations. Now, coming out of the second one, this is junctional epidermolysis bullosa. Junctional means it is at the junction of the epidermis and the dermis. And uh, where it two types of uh, antigens are involved laminin 5 or BP antigen 2. So, we showed in the that previous diagram that BP. Antigen 2, that is BP antigen 2, is at the thendermo epidermal junction. So, pamphigoid antigen 2, that is BP 180 or collagen 17, mutations can come, blister in lamina lucida. It is an autosomal recessive disease. And there are two forms of the disease. One is known as a lethal or the curlix type, this which has lamina 5 mutations. So, the child does not survive long after he has this junctional epidermal bullosa. And non lethal forms are called the non halide types. The limitations may be at laminin 5 or BP antigen 180. And the child has a normal lifespan. It may be present at birth or soon afterwards. Again, there is a severe skin fragility. What happens is at, at a minuscule of a trauma, there will be a lot of blistering or external coming out. And what, what will happen? When there is a lot of blisters, they will burst and they call denudation of the skin. So you can have involvement of the teeth, you may have malformed prematurely lost teeth, and you may have anonychia, that is, nails may be shed. Now coming on to the third one, that is a dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. So this is the photographs of the dystrophic ones. You see there is, the web spaces are gone, there are no nails, and a lot of scarring is there. So collagen, there is collagen 7 mutations. So we saw collagen in the Sub-epidermal areas, collagen 7, so there is mutations there in the, and the blisters are in the sub-lamina densa, that is in the type towards the dermis site. It could be inherited as autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant. And uh, the, there is skin fragility, there is a lot of scarring with milia formation. What is milia? These are small white papules which form the scarred area. These are, there are sort of an inter-epidermal cysts. So this dystrophic epidermolysis will always characterize a milia formation. The onset is at birth or infancy. And the blistering of skin occurs mainly on the trauma prone sites. The oral blisters and scarring, there could be oral blisters also and scarring that can lead to and glylosia, that is the tongue and there could be a microstomia, difficulty in opening of the mouth. There could be formation of esophageal lesions. There could be painful dysphagia, structures in the esophageal. There could be perianal blistering, erosions and scarring. That could lead to stenosis and fecal retention. There could be uh, scarring in the eye that could lead to symptom of chlorine erosions of acidity. And this repeated blistering and progressive scarring leads to contractures and deformities. So it is a quite a, a difficult uh, condition for the Okay. 
now coming on to the management of epidermolysis bullosa basically you need investigations like skin biopsy and the gold standard would be electron microscopy from the electron microscopy you can get to the level of the split then antigen mapping as we were discussing about the lemon and five etc the antigen mapping and histochemistry and there could be prenatal diagnosis also can be made so the couples who are on risk of uh, giving birth to uh, the babies with epidermolysis below in the future pregnancies can undergo the prenatal dna testing so what is the main treatment main treatment is basically conservative you need to avoid trauma maintain an adequate nutrition and hydration if there there are blister formation prevention of sepsis care of oral and oral mucosa management of contractures and the deformities now coming on to the important chunk of disorders which is known as the acquired or autoimmune blistering disorders they could be classified simply into two categories called intra epidermal or sub epidermal so intra epidermal means inside the epidermis this would be pamphigus polyceus then pamphigus polyceus has three variants or pamphigus erythematosus endemic pamphigus or fogus l1 pamphigus herpetiformis then coming up with the pamphigus vulgaris that is pamphigus vegetans it is one of the variants paraneoplastic pamphigus iga pamphigus sub epidermal blisters could be pullus pamphigoid cicatricial pamphigoid pamphigoid gestation is means in the pregnancy linear iga disease dermatitis herpetiformis and epidermolysis bullosa equisita so depending on the level of the split it could be intraepidermal or sub epidermal now intraepidermal blisters are characteristically flaccid ones and sub epidermal as the blister is deep inside there are tens fluid filled regions now another way to classify would be what type of these are autoimmune blistering disorders so you have definite antibodies it could be antibodies igg or iga em commonly g and a and all most of the epidermal intraepidermal like pamphigus foliaceus and pamphigus vulgaris which form the majority chunk of the pamphigus with the disorder the antibodies are igg but in there is another called iga once you find iga antibodies inside the epidermis then it could be iga pamphigus it is not that common again in the sub epidermal bullous pamphigoid is the most commonest types then these are these all contain IgG, but there is another one called linear IgA and dermatitis herpetiformis, where you find antibodies which are IgA. Now, starting with what is again the, this is the important diagram which we have shown in the previous uh, part also this is basal keratinocyte containing the hemidesmosomes so all this pamphigus vulgaris and foliaceous dermis will be inside the epidermis then coming on to the dermoepidermal junction this pamphigus bullous pamphigoid stuff will be there then coming down low down this epidermolysis bullosa equisita so the important antigens here are the hemidesmosomes is bp antigen 1 bp antigen 2 is collagen 4 and collagen 7 these are the important players in this autoimmune connective tissue disorders now the pamphigus comes from the word called uh, pamphix which means to blister or bubble so these are blistering disorders once you do a this the pathology of these lesions there are intra epidermal blisters so pamphigus group whether it is foliaceous or vulgaris the level of blisters is inside the epidermis and how they are formed the auto antibodies they break the cell adhesion between the different keratinocytes so the keratinocytes are connected to each other by cell adhesions the antibodies act on the cell adhesions and cause separation of keratinocytes and these these keratinocytes they become separated 
so they become circular cells and this is known as acantholysis now what is the pathology as i told you the in vivo bound and circulating igg antibodies but in certain cases iga like iga pemphigus will be directed against the epidermal adhesion cadherins are basically calcium dependent cell to cell adhesion molecules and they will break these cadherins found on the cell surface of these keratinocytes so pemphigus as we have discussed it could be vulgaris that is a common vulgaris means common it has a variant called pemphigus vegetans then there could be pemphigus foliaceus which has three variants herpetiformis erythematosus and endemic pemphigus or drug induced pemphigus paraneoplastic pemphigus iga pemphigus iga pemphigus is intraepidermal or subcolon that is very superficial now pemphigus vulgaris is a disease of middle aged and in indian context indian population more younger people are affected and it is quite common once you sit in opd you may find lot of patients of pemphigus vulgaris male and females are equally affected and the target antigens this is very important the target antigen is mainly desmoglein 3 desmoglein 1 in few patients so then desmoglein 3 is found in basically in the mucosa so the oral cavity and you know, all are commonly affected in pemphigus vulgaris and desmoglein 1 and 3 may be found in skin also and desmoglein 1 predominantly in the skin so disease of middle age very common in ashkenazi jews male and female are equally affected now the etiology the target antigens desmoglein 3 and desmoglein 1 in few patient desmoglein 3 is expressed only in the basal and suprabasal layers of the epidermis and desmoglein 1 is found throughout the epidermis but in the mucosa desmoglein 3 is strongly expressed and desmoglein 1 is weakly expressed so in pemphigus vulgaris generally the history of the patient starts with formation of oral ulcers these are intractable difficult to treat and then these flaccid skin lesions will come up as desmoglein 3 is targeted which and mucosa only has desmoglein 3 so in case of pemphigus foliaceus the other intraepidermal disorder as desmoglein 3 is not targeted the oral erosions are very rare this is an important point so in pemphigus vulgaris both 3 and 1 but in pemphigus foliaceus only 1 so pemphigus vulgaris the clinical features are painful erosions of the oral mucosa greater than 50% of the patients will have flaccid blisters and widespread cutaneous lesions and these as these lesions are flaccid they will rupture easily and they will form raw areas with tendency to spread and long time to heal so this erode this blister will erode there would be a erosion and they will spread polycyclic polycyclically so common sites are oral cavity then all the mucosa are groins can be involved genitalia can be involved axilla scalp face and neck now sometimes you a lot of patients refer from ent that is oral lesions are not healing so what we do we do a small test called zang smear and we demonstrate cantilitic cells then it is a clue to ambiguous vulgaris so pathogenesis i have already told the ig4 IgG4 pemphigus autoantibodies bind to desmoglein 3 and 1 find in desmosomes which are present on keratinocyte cell membrane there is lysis of the intracellular cement structure acantholysis and intraepidermal blister formation is there the blister cavity can consists mainly of acantholytic cells now pemphigus foliaceus pemphigus vulgaris the clinical features as i told you all patients have painful erosions in oral mucosa we cannot label it all but most of the patients have majority of the patients have painful erosions intact blisters are rare in the mucosa because they are fragile and easily breakable so you don't find intact blisters in the oral mucosa there are basically uh, erosions majority of the patient greater than 50% will also develop flaccid blisters and widespread cutaneous erosions and these blisters are flaccid they contain fluid which is initially clear and may will turn with time to hemorrhagic turbid or even seroporulent bulla rupture easily to form painful raw areas surfaces with tendency to spread and long time to heal the common side are already told 
So important thing is if a patient comes to you with a non-healing erosion in the oral cavity or in the genitalia, you suspect pancreas and proceed as we will tell you later. So this is our photographs of pancreas. So these are very stubborn erosions present in the oral cavity on the lips, on the tongue, and these are the erosions on the body. So these, if you see closely, these erosions are spreading. These are polycyclic spread. That signifies pancreas vulgaris. Now there are few signs when the patient comes to you. This is called a Nikolsky sign. What is Nikolsky sign? Is just near the blister on the morning prominence, give a tangential pressure, the skin will peel off. This is called Nikolsky sign. And that signifies active pamphigus vulgaris. And Bula spread sign, also known as Ashgo Hansen sign. This is a Bula. You just mark the Bula with a pen. You can see the marking of the pen. And give a vertical pressure on the center of the Bula. It will spread. So as the split is inside the epidermis, it will spread. This is known as Bula spread sign. Now diagnosis, you make a Zang smear. It is a bedside test. And in any case of pamphigus, it has to be done. Basically, what do you do on the bulla area? On the bulla, just denude the bulla with a blade and with the blunt end of the blade, scrape the base, put it on the slide and stain with gym sustain. What you will see, these are acantholytic cells. These are large, these are modified keratinocytes which are rounded, large, have a big nucleus, hypochromatic nucleus and basophilic cytoplasm. Large, round with hypochromatic nucleus hypochromatic nucleus and perinuclear halo due to peripheral condensation of cytoplasm. These are known as acantholytic or Zang cells. Now, once you do a histopathology, what do you see? You find supra-basal split. This is the epidermis. This is stratum corneum. So, this is the basal layer. You find supra-basal split. This is also known as tombstone appearance. So, this manifests in the skin as bulla. This is a fluid filled lesion. So this will contain what? This will contain neutrophils, lymphocytes, and the acantholytic cells. Now, there is a two terms, you know, all of you know, there is direct immunofluorescence and indirect immunofluorescence. So direct immunofluorescence, what do you do? Just perilesional, take a skin biopsy with a punch and send it for immunofluorescence. So you find, this is supra-basal, you find intracellular IgG and C3 deposit. This is known as a fishnet or honeycomb pattern. This is characteristic of pamphigus vulgaris. Now, how do you treat pamphigus vulgaris? It's difficult to treat. You know, need high dose of steroid. Generally, you give steroid of 1 milligram per kg body weight. But in pamphigus vulgaris, you need a higher dose that is 1.5 to 2 milligram per milligram per kg per day. So, steroids, then you can give as these high steroids are uh, may not be good. So you go with pulse therapy. That means you give three days high dose of dexamethasone, that is 100 milligram. And one of the three days you give cyclophosphamide in 5% dextrose. Or you can give methylprednisone pulse also. The best part of treatment uh, there for three days, you start with high dose of steroids, start a steroid sparing immunosuffixes like azathioprine or cyclophosphamide. Once the lesions stop coming and the existing lesions are healed, start tapering the steroids and maintain the patient on the immunosuppressants like azathioprine or cyclophos for a, for a long time. It may be for six months to one year also. Then other form of treatments that you can give dapson, cyclosporine. And there is these days, this is becoming a treatment of choice known as monoclonal antibodies, that is rituximab, which is anti CD20 monoclonal antibody. And the dose regime commonly followed is 375 milligram per meter square once a week for four weeks. Now, coming on to the variant of Pamphigus vulgaris, it is known as Pamphigus vegetans. What is Pamphigus vegetans? They will start as Pamphigus vulgaris, flat cell blister, but these erosions. They will form erosion, then there would be a healing with fungoid vegetations of papillomatous proliferation and commonly the intertigenous areas and scalp and face will come. So maybe involved. So this is behind the ear, some intertigenous area, you find a vegetative growth in the patient in the case of pamphigus vulgaris. So it is a basically a morphological variant. And then the tongue you may find characteristic cerebri from changes. So these are two types of pamphigus veritans, new man or Hilupi. New man is 
quite severe man helopeus are mild one but the treatment remains the same steroids and immunosuppressive agents now pamphigus foliaceus another variant of pamphigus that we have discussed vulgaris where the level of spread is supra basal in the epidermis there are stratum corneum malphigi layer and the basal layer so stratum corneum granulosum then in pamphigus foliaceus the level of split is very superficial so you rarely see blisters coming up and there the desmoglein 1 is involved desmoglein 3 is very rarely involved so no oral lesions are there so it presents as scaly crusted cutaneous erosions in a seboric distribution that is face neck and upper trunk are there no mucosal involvement is there nikolsky sign is positive so that means if you give a tangential pressure on the bulla or the crusts around the bony protrusions it will peel off in the histopathology you find subcorneal blister the level of split is very high and the subcorneal blister will have a lot of neutrophils and acanthocytic cells and once you do a direct immunofluorescence you find intracellular deposits of igg4 in desmoglein 1 as compared to pamphigus vulgaris where desmoglein 3 and 1 and fish net appearance is seen so this is pamphigus foliaceus you can see the difference there is no polycyclic spread characteristic distribution of the seboric areas and subcorneal blisters is there coming on to the pamphigus the some of the variants of pamphigus these are pamphigus erythematosus or also known as near usher syndrome pamphigus erythematosus is basically a localized variant of pamphigus foliaceus generally the lesions are to the malar area only they are typically scaly crusted and malar regions or seboric areas and oral areas may be rarely involved and if you do the immunology you would find both pamphigus and features of lupus erythematosus so it is a combination of lupus and pamphigus foliaceus you will find igg and ig3 deposits on the surface of the keratinocytes and glandular ig and c3 on the basement membrane zone and ana may be positive it is associated with myasthenia gravis or thymoma then coming on to another term called pamphigus herpetiformis so basically it is in a dh like distribution dermatitis herpetiformis is rare and atypical variant of pamphigus and resembles dermatitis herpetiformis in its earlier phase what you have you have grouped widespread uh, pruritic papules and vesicles which develop on the erythematous background and most patients with pamphigus pamphigus have a clinical variant of pamphigus foliaceus and remainder may have a variant of pamphigus vulgaris and once you do a biopsy you will find a lot of eosinophils in the epidermis and subcorneal pustule with without a cancellosis histologically and igg antibodies may be there then third is the endemic pamphigus foliaceus this is Fogo selvagon. This is restricted to found in certain areas of Brazil and Colombia, and it is common in children. It is and it is thought to be due to a arthropod bite. That is the Brachli called Simulidae family. And initial lesions are flaccid. Nikolsky sign is positive. Head and neck are first involved. And the characteristic thing is patient will complain of a lot of burning. And this burn, this burning, comes from the word from Fogo selvagon, or it is known as Portuguese for wildfire. Mucous membranes are not involved. and once you do histology you find it identical with pamphigus foliaceus now treatment of pamphigus foliaceus and its variants pamphigus foliaceus is not that uh, aggressive disease so you just it can be uh, treated with topical or intral lesional steroids and sometimes you may require oral steroid but not in that high dose of 1.5 to 2 mg it may be 20 to 40 mg will be able to control sometimes pamphigus foliaceus is also very difficult to treat you may require immunosuppressants like azathioprine or cyclophosphamide another important term is the drug induced pamphigus certain drugs like uh, sulfadrel containing drugs like captopril ranipril ranipril which is commonly I and mean, it will commonly used in hypertension can cause pamphigus like lesions okay and penicillamine which is a chelating agent so you can find uh, lesions of pamphigus with these drug induced pamphigus so what and what these drugs do is they form auto antibodies and which may lead to the breakage of this adhesive bond between the keratinocytes and what will be the course once you stop the drugs these lesions will disappear 
another important thing is paraneoplastic you know no paraneoplastic paraneoplasia basically any tumor is there we form we have some cytokines paraneoplastics which lead to paraneoplastic syndrome so paraneoplastic pancreas whenever there is lot of stubborn Yeah. When and there there is lot of uh, some patient may contain a lot of stubborn uh, oral intractable ulcer. There could be ulceration in esophageal, nasopharynx, and with. So this may be a type of uh, paraneoplastic pancreas. It is associated with underlying neoplasms, malignancy, which is going to be both benign and uh, malignant, and glomerular non-Hodgkin lymphomas, Castleman disease, and thymomas. And patient will complain of intractable stomatitis, persist, which is persistent and resulted to ther resistant to therapy. There could be a lot of pseudomembranous conjunctivitis, which will lead to scarring, esophageal, nasophageal involvement would be there. And characteristic, you will find polymorphic cutaneous lesions, which are flaccid or tense bulla, and EMF, that is called erythema multiform lesions, palm and soles may be involved, and treatment may be treatment of the uh, neoplasm. Now coming on to the last type of pancreas, which I told you, generally we have IgG antibodies, but there is a term called IgA pancreas. In this, the antibody, auto antibodies are IgA. So we have formed it a different entity called IgA pancreas. Pancreas, superficial tense blister, uh, superficial flaccid blisters in the epidermis only. It, it is found in middle aged men or elderly. Uh, there could be two types. The subcorneal pustular dermatosis and intraepidermal neutrophilic type, SPD, or the intraepidermal types. In the SPD, that is the subcorneal, that is a superficial layer, pustular dermatosis, IgA, onto the bodies, upper epidermal surfaces will be involved, while Ig, that is intraepidermal neutrophilic types, Ig autobentase throughout the autoantic bodies throughout the epidermis. So, SPD is some sort of a pancreas foliaceous type. And and intraepidermal neutrophilic type is some sort of a amphibious vulgaris types. So you have flaccid vesicles of pustules which form characteristic annular lesions, means annular in an annular pattern with crust in the center of the lesions. So once you have a patient with flaccid vesicles and pustules and they are forming annular pattern, think of IgF amphibious also. And uh, Important symptom in IgA pancreas is a lot of pruritus. The common sites is axilla and groin, so the flexural area, the mucus pulmonary involvement is very rare. So, what you need to do, you need DIF and DIF you will find IgA antibodies present. The treatment is they should respond very well to Dapson, and if it does not respond to Dapson, start immunosuppressive therapies. Now, coming on to the sub epidermal blisters. So, how do you differentiate between epidermal and sub epidermal? Epidermal blisters are flaccid, while the subepidermal blisters are tense, or they are very tense formation. So, subepidermal blisters are generally very common in the elderly age group, and the target antigens are totally different. These are not desmoglein; these are BP antigen one, which should be shown on the diagram, or called BP thirty two thirty and BP antigen two, or bullous pancreatic antigen one. 80 or type 7 collagens. The antibodies which are deposited are IgG, IgA, IgE, and complements along the basement membrane zone. In the pancreas group, it was inside the epidermis. Now it is on the basement membrane zones. So majority of diseases like bullous pancreas, which is a commonest one in this prototypical disorders, the antibodies are IgG, but sometimes it is IgA in case of dermatitis herpetiformis. Okay. Now, what is the pathogenesis? The antibodies against Ig8, BP8, 180 or 230 bind to the target antigens in the dermoepidermal junction. 
this will activate complement pathway which will release chemo attractants there will be recruitment of these nodules and neutrophils they will there will be release of proteolytic enzymes and basement membrane separates and the subepidermal blister is formed so what is the clinical features of bullous pemphigoid first they are common in the elderly they are, they are, but there are different phases there is a non bullous phase a patient will complain a lot of varieties eczema type of lesions urticarial lesions coming up papular lesions coming up then there is a bullous phase tense vesicle and bulla containing fluid fluid will be formed on a normal base of the skin or erythematous base there rupture difficulty tense blister will rupture and form denuded areas with tendency to heal spontaneously as compared to the pemphigus vulgaris where the lesions will spread on the rupture of the bulla nikolsky sign is negative as the lesions are deep and the sites are commonly the abdomen lower abdomen inner thighs groins flexural areas and flexural aspects of the limbs mucosal involvement is very rare as compared to pemphigus vulgaris only 10 to 40% of cases now these could be associated bullous pemphigoid are in elderly so malignancies can be associated you can have associated diabetes ulcerative colitis autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis so this is a picture of bullous pemphigoid see there are so tense blisters are present fluid filled tense blisters once you do a zang smear they will find lot of eosinophils and few neutrophils but no acantholytic cells acantholytic cells are only present in intra epidermal blistering diseases so differences placid bullar tense blisters acantholytic cells present in the sub in the intra epidermal pemphigus and pemphigus foraceous vulgaris but no acantholytic cells in these angsmears once you do histopathology you find sub epidermal bulla as compared to intra epidermal bulla in the pemphigus group of disorders lot of eosinophils is there dermis shows lot of eosinophils mononuclear cells and neutrophils and in the dif you know with pathology you can find c3 iga g and iga igm along the basement membrane zone in circulation so this is a sub epid this is the epidermis this is a sepid of sub epidermal blister containing neutrophils eosinophils predominantly neutrophils and this is the dif you see c3 and igg deposit on the linearly along the basement membrane zone now the treatments are steroids systemic steroids 40 to 80 mg per but not as high as pemphigus vulgaris but 40 to 50 mg tafson also gives good results combination of tetracycline and nicotinamide and sometimes immunosuppressants like azathioprine or cyclophosphamide may be required now coming on to the variant that is a dermatitis dermatitis herpetiformis as we had uh, pemphigus herpetiformis where there is a intensely pruritic chronic recurrent papulovesicular lesions and commonly on the extensor part of the limbs you will find buttocks you find lot of itchy scratchy lesions and this is generally associated with gluten sensitivity age group is around 20 to 55 years males are predominant and patient who are gluten sensitive so diets like wheat barley oats and rye will aggravate the lesions and what is the antigen antigen is thought to be a gut epithelial antigen which cross reacts with the skin now in this important thing is the antibodies are iga antibodies which are directed against the gliadin and auto antigens like reticulin and endomycin c3 ig igm may also be seen so predominantly iga group papular vesicular lesions on the extensors of the arms forearms buttocks and gluten sensitivity peripheral dermatitis herpetic formis now coming on to the this is the group vesic papular vesicular lesions on the elbows and lot of explorations are there now how do you manage dh do a biopsy you will find characteristic neutrophilic microabscesses at the dermal papillae and then when once you do a dif you find granular iga deposit in the dermal papillae treatment is you have to have a gluten free diet dapson is a treatment of choice 100 to 100 mg per day and if it does not respond to dapson that means it is not dh patients who are sensitive to dapson can be given given sulfapyridine tetracycline nicotinamide and colchicine are the alternative treatments so dh remember it is iga mediated disease and it is subepidermal you can find on the dermal papillae 
abscesses. Coming on to another third variant called the cicatricial pamphigoid. It is a type of rare twisting disorder which needs lead to permanent scarring of the affected area. Mucosal lesions are there predominantly and they affect the oropharynx, nasopharynx, conjunctiva, larynx, genitalia and esophagus. And there could be a lot of sequelae. There could be oropharyngeal adhesions, esophageal structure, laryngeal structure called induced strider, intraorital shrinkage if it involves genitalia, if it involves the eye, symbiotic, symbiotic, statuoid. And in the histopathology, you find subepidermal villa similar to BP. But in the DIF, you have linear C3 IgA fibronogen and occasionally IgM IgA deposits. And indirect immunofluorescence, you find linear and base membrane 20% lesions. Now, another variant is the herpes gestationis. Now, this is basically bullous pemphigoid coming up in the pregnant females. Young women, it occurs in pregnancy, generally in the second trimester, 21 to 28 weeks of gest uh, gestation or within first week postnatally. And the lesions again start as severely prorotic articular wheels of plants, characteristically on the periumbilical or the lower and abdomen of the thighs. Mucosa are really involved. And then you find uh, the blisters coming up, which are tense. The recurrence may occur in sub subsequent pregnancies also, or when the patient takes oral contraceptive pills. Once you do a DIA, that is, you do a, a perilesional biopsy and do a direct immunofluorescence, you find C3 and IgG deposit at the basement membrane zone, similar to the pamphigoid. Now, treatment would be steroids. As in pregnancy, you can't give anything else. Steroids will be safe. Now, coming on to the linear IgA disease, as IgA pemphigus, linear IgA disease means you have IgA on the autoantibodies as compared to IgG in pemphigoid. So, it is a subepidermal blistering disorder of children and adults with skin and mucous membrane involved in IgA disease. Mucous membrane may also be involved. And once you do a biopsy, you find in the DIF characteristic IgA deposition at the basement membrane zone. It may be of two types. CBDC, chronic bullous disease of childhood and linear IgA disease. But there is only a different uh, age presentation. Linear IgA disease comes up in the adult or late age and in CBDC it is in the children. And characteristic is that in this bullous disease of childhood, we find periorificial or perianal around the orifices, annular lesions which are common in CBDC. So this is a disease, this is a tense blister, IgA disease, linear IgA disease, and see in the child you have a string of pearls, annular region, multiple bulla forming circles. So this is characteristic of CPDC. These are tense bulla as compared to flaccid, so subepidermal blistering. So chronic bullous disease of childhood, autoimmune subepidermal blistering disease of children characterized by IgA in the basement membrane zones. Onset is around five years of age, articarial plaques, and blisters at the edges, you form string or pearl appearance and localization region around the orifice, perioral or perigenital. Spontaneous remission usually occurs with age and direct immunofluorescence you see IgG, IgA at basement membrane zone. The treatment is Dapson is very effective, response usually within 28 to 48 hours. So this is CVTC patient, you see tense blisters and these are annular regions coming up. So ring of stuff, pearls appearance. You can see here also annular arrangement of the blisters. So important thing is it is an IgA disease. Now coming on to the last entity in the subepidermal blisters, this is epidermolysis bullosa equivisita EDA. It is an autoimmune disease of the elderly. Trauma-induced subepidermal blistering or a clinical picture which is indistinguishable from the bullous pamphigoid. You will find lesions of bullous pamphigoid in elderly, this is very tense blisters on trauma-induced, it's really trauma-induced. So you have IgG antibodies directed to, not to BP antigen 1 or BP antigen 2, to the type 7 collagen which we showed in the lamina densa in the lower parts, which is a major component of anchoring fimbrils. So this antigen antibody complex will call, cause direct destruction of the anchoring fibrillar filaments or inflammatory response via complement system. This will cause split in the basement membrane zone and formation of a subepidermal blisters. The clinical features, it is found in the late age, four to six decade. The non-inflammatory type is called the flaccid. 
will form flaccid blisters of the trauma prone areas they will heal with scarring and hyperpigmentation it can lead to sick attrition that is scarring alopecia or dystrophy of the nails then there is inflammatory tie with tense blisters and articular parts on a reddish base that heals without scarring so dots of the hand which are trauma prone site and feet elbow knees it could be associated with sle that is systemic lupus erythematosus or inflammatory bowel disease now the diagnosis is very uh, you do a biopsy you will find a sub epidermal blistering with or without neutrophilic infiltrate on the immunopathology you find linear iga deposits in c3 sometimes igm igm but how to differentiate between the uh, bullous pamphlicoid and the eba is you do a salt splitting technique the and you find the antibodies on the dermal side in the eba by it on the epidermal side on the bullous pamphlicoid now the treatment of eba that is epidermolysis bullous equisita is supportive prevent trauma you have to use if steroids in combination with dapsone sulfonamides or immunosuppressants colchicine cyclosporine iv myoglobin have been tried prognosis is it is a chronic disease with remission and exacerbations inflammatory type is uh, amenable to treatment so you give steroids or something patient will respond with the non inflammatory types is very difficult to suppress and but sometimes the disease may remit spontaneously now coming on to the last slide what is the approach to a patient with vesicular bullous disorder suppose a patient comes to you in the opd and has clinical history and features think of see the what is the age of onset and family see the drug history if there is newborn child presenting with on lesions in the trauma prone sites erosions blisters think of epidermolysis bullosa maybe junctional depending on the site of the lesion junctional the simplex one or the dystrophic types any history of drug intake drug intake like captopril or uh, or penicillin thing of pamphigus which is induced by drugs and there is pamphigoid also which can be induced by drugs like uh, thiazide diuretics are common cause of uh, uh, pamphigoid like lesion formation so think about pool of drug history hereditary if it child young newborn child is there or acquired after if the patient is presenting in somewhere in the adulthood or the late age think of the acquired ones the nature of the bulla flaccid that means it is epidermal blistering is there if it is tense it is sub epidermal do the clinical test like nikolsky sign and bulla spread sign to see for the cantholysis if it is they are present then it is intra epidermal it could be pamphigus vulgaris commonly it could be pamphigus foliaceus if it is tense blisters are there and nikolsky sign is negative it is pamphigoid group of disorders do a sang smear if the cantholytic cells are present neutrophils are present or eosinophils are present look for that if the cantholytic cells are there then it means it is intra epidermal split it is pamphigus foliaceus or vulgaris if the cantholytic cells are not there then it is sub epidermal one it could be pam pamphigoid if there are a lot of eosinophils think of pamphigoid do a histopathology the level of split could be there intra epidermal sub epidermal do a dif direct immunofluorescence will give you a fishnet appearance in pamphigus vulgaris if it is a linear basement zone appearance and it could be bullous pamphigoid then indirect immunofluorescence you basically draw a blood sample and see for the type of antibodies indirect immunofluorescence the role is in the how the treatment is effective or not for use lot of steroids in pamphigus vulgaris the level of antibodies will decrease so you can prognosticate the patient according to the indirect immunofluorescence and with this we end the chapter thank you so much stay safe Okay thank you so much bye